A new year means new models. And from what problems I'm seeing around the internet, a lot of you got new airbrushes too. So I want to do a bit of a primer video, haha. <laughs> Explain exactly how airbrushes work, troubleshoot some issues, and of course go over how to use one to help paint a miniature. And to help show off some simple painting methods, I'll be bringing along some Battle Sisters bikers from this month's One Page Rules Patreon. Most of the skills I'll be showing off on one of them should be pretty simple, so don't worry too much about the level of detail on the model here or what the final will look like. This is about the airbrush, though I will make sure it gets finished. The standard airbrushes we use for miniature painting are these dual action internal mix gravity feed airbrushes. Whether cheap or expensive, all of them will have some things in common. It'll have a guide, a cap, a nozzle, and a needle. It'll have either attached or detachable gravity feed reservoir, which just means it's on top of the brush, a dual action trigger, and a backing to cover the needle, which can either have a window or not. Some also come with a flow guide. The guide cap is just that. It's not important to the airbrush's function. With or without it, it'll spray air. But it will help the operator, that's you, with centering and distances. So the one on my CR Plus here is quite open, and that's fine because it only acts as a visual gauge to where the brush is pointed, and to stop you poking yourself with the needle or bending it. The cap, nozzle, and needle are a full unified set. So one of the first points of troubleshooting if your brush is having trouble spraying is to make sure that these all match the set they are for. If using a 0.05 millimeter needle, it absolutely needs to have a 0.05 millimeter cap and nozzle too. So check to make sure that you have the right cap for the nozzle and needle that you're using, if things don't seem to be spraying right. This was an issue that was solved recently in my Discord when someone was having trouble there. The reason that they have to match though is because of how the air flows to make the airbrush work. And why I feel like internal mix is a bit misleading in the sales of these things. With the cap off, we can see the air outlet here. This is where the air actually comes from. Then air flows through the cap and out the opening in the middle. So if this cap isn't tight, air will start to come out of the sides. Then the air will grab paint from the nozzle to create the mist. Which means the mixing point is actually at the very tip of the airbrush here which is why a wrong cap will mess up that mixing process and why it's important to also keep the opening of the cap clean, just as much as the nozzle itself. If we lose airflow here, the brush won't spray right. The gravity feed cup is where the paint goes and the nozzle is where it comes out. Air never gets into any of this, but that doesn't mean gravity is the only thing doing all the work. As paint gets pulled from the nozzle, because it's filled with fluid, it suctions more into that enclosed tube. So don't worry about the angle you're holding it out. Though called a gravity feed, gravity only matters getting the paint to the bottom of the cup. Once there, the vacuum will do the rest. The needle is what controls the volume of paint or fluid able to pass through. At the tip, they would be flushed together, closed off, and sealed. This is why it's important they match the right sizes too and as you pull back on the needle, it opens the diameter of the nozzle that paint can flow through. The more open, the more paint. But that's not the only thing at play. The dual action part of these airbrushes refers to airflow and needle control. I think most miniature painters keep their compressors at around 25 PSI, though some of the smaller USB versions blow at about 18 PSI. Either way though, the PSI of the compressor isn't as important as the trigger when it comes to how much air gets through, though they should be kept in that 30 to 15 PSI range. Pushing down on the trigger is what starts the airflow, but it's regulated, so if you only push a little, you only get a little bit of air, all the way down and you get the maximum PSI it was set to. So control of this trigger is key to getting the most from the airbrush. Learning how to softly press down and pull back 
will be important to using this tool for more than just priming. The last two parts to touch on are pretty simple. If your needle backing has a window, its purpose is to allow you to pull the needle back much farther than the trigger can. So you can manually get large dry chunks out or speed up the rate of spray for cleaning. The flow guide actually determines how far you can pull the needle back before it gets stopped. So if you find yourself always pulling back too far, you can use this to flat out stop yourself from doing so. But it's not easy to rely on and gives up some of your control for it, so I don't use it much myself. I've discussed my method for how I like to thin paint meant for the airbrush in other videos, but I'll go over it quickly again here. When it comes to the paint's flow through the airbrush, there's a bit of a Goldilocks conundrum. It can't be too thick or it won't spray at all, and it can't be too thin or it won't paint the miniature properly. So instead of just throwing thinner in with the paint until it looks right, my solution is I'll use a medium that's already the perfect viscosity for spraying. So this would be a medium with a low viscosity, but not completely fluid like waters and thinners. Then mix the paint into that so it'll be the same viscosity every time. If you only have thick mediums and thin thinners, then we can also make a batch of our own flow medium. Just go back and forth between the medium and thinner until you get something that's fluid enough to travel through the airbrush, but still thick enough to keep control. Make a big batch of this so you can just fill your airbrush with it and some paint when needed, and you won't really have to worry about thinning paint to the right consistency each time. The general fallback excuse for getting an airbrush is a standard one. Well, at least I can use it for priming. And yeah, that's a pretty important part. So let's do a good job of it. The best thing to start with is a tack coat. The distance the airbrush is from the model will play a big role in its use, and this is one of them. By starting a little further back from the model, the paint will be more broken up by the time it gets to the surface of the figure. By using this to our advantage, we can create a light surface for the actual primer to stick to more evenly. And when it comes to priming, that's when I get in a little closer and give it a lot of air and paint by pushing the trigger down and pulling the needle back. In that order too, by the way, always start your airflow before pulling back the needle for almost every single technique from here on out. Though it's not as important with priming because we're not worried about splatter. The trick to a primer is to get it in all the places on a model and by using the air to push the paint into the cracks and hard to reach places. That's how it gets in there without needing to always get a perfect angle. A zenithil is so named because it relates to the zenith, an imaginary point directly above you in the sky. So if we look down from the zenith of the model, this is all we can see. Which in turn means if this is the only direction we spray from, these are the only surfaces the spray will catch, since spray from an airbrush is, for the most part, unidirectional in a cone-like shape, much like the light in this example is. So what this part is really about is angles, using the angle of your spray to create effects. So by only spraying directly from the zenith, we can get a really deep contrast between the top of the model and the underside of it. The further out at an angle we go, the further down the model the light will go. But this can be useful for more than just a zenithal start. We can also use it to add atmosphere to a model by spraying color from different angles or areas. I'm going to give her a bit of an orange from underneath, but only from the front. This will have the effect as though there is a glowing light on the ground just out of shot of her base. My next process for the sister is to spray a coat of red over top, which is a good time to talk about the difference between a brush painted layer and an airbrush layer. When painting with an airbrush, the one big advantage it has is that it's almost impossible to put on unevenly. Even when applying a wash through the airbrush, which is totally possible by really thinning down the wash with a thinner or water, it's still going to come out more even with less pooling than the same wash would when applied by a brush. This is why base coats from an airbrush will always come out smoother and with more coverage. 
However, the trade-off is that you lose accuracy along certain parts. No matter how accurately you can spray with an airbrush, there's always going to be overspray and feathering into other parts. So it can realistically only handle the big things, unless you don't mind working with the overspray later on. But it's not all airbrush versus brush, as I like to use them in tandem for the best results. By only putting a small amount of paint into the medium mix, it'll make it so that the output is quite transparent in a single layer. And because the airbrush puts out nice, smooth, even layers, it's a great tool for glazing and blending between layers that get brushed on. So while the brush takes care of the sharp lines and textures that make up a layer, by adding the color used to do that layer to the airbrush, it can feather that out a bit before getting to the next layer. Even just a small layer between colors will brighten the darks in a specific area to create a smoother contrast between layers. In the same vein, once a model is finished with highlights and shadows, using some transparent color layers can add extra atmosphere to a figure. I already did the orange during the Zenithal, but I can expand on that just to give the areas I repainted or the edges around the orange a little more fade. But this doesn't even have to be related colors at all. A little bit of a neon green or yellow sprayed in random small areas can give the atmosphere of the bike moving around a lit city, and it doesn't take much to give the effect. So if you ever finish a model and think to yourself, this needs something more, pull out the airbrush and just start spraying things. It'll be scary at first, but could end up with something really cool looking. When it comes time to clean the airbrush, this is the method I like to use. Start by flooding the cup with a bunch of water, which means it'll be handy to have a large water bottle with a good nozzle nearby, and use an old or cheap brush to dilute the paint still remaining. Then I'll spray out what was left in the chamber before percolating to make it flow backwards. You do that by just blocking the tip with your fingers and giving it a bit of air. Then dump this whole thing into the dirty paint water. The whole point of percolating is to get any bits out, so it would be pointless to try and spray it out the front. The bits would just get back in. Then I'll take some paper towel or tissue and clean out anything dried in the cup, making sure to pull these bits away. After that, it's just repeat. More water, spray, percolate, and pour out until the airbrush is clean. For one last point of troubleshooting, if later on you get back to your airbrush and the needle is a little hard to pull back, this can be solved by just pulling out the needle completely and adding some cleaner to a tissue, then wiping off dry paint from the body of the needle. Doing this when at the end of a session might help prevent it, but since dried paint tends to come out with the needle, it's a good way of clearing things too. Just make sure not to bend the tip. Please subscribe if you like this video, and check the link in the description to my Discord where I talk all sorts of nonsense about miniatures painting, provide critique on paint jobs, and occasionally stream.